Welcome to the second 20-minute tutorial on how to write a Gothic script with reference to those in the Great Parchment Book of Waterford, kept by the Waterford Treasures Museums. If you've yet to watch part one, look that up first. Next I'll demonstrate the group of letters with lower arches, as on U. Letter A first. It begins like U, but without the top serif and just below the guideline. I'll add a slight curve to the back of these letters, but you can keep them straight if that's easier. For the top, the left corner of the nib just touches the right corner of the first stroke and then is similar to an N arch. Very slightly downwards, but not as diagonal as the base. Letter D is just like the A with an ascender. The top part is a little longer. That way it sticks out beyond the ascender stroke. Letter G begins the same as A and D. However, I curve out slightly towards the baseline and continue just below it. Next, I add a fine line. You can do that slow and straight, but my curve remains thin from rotating the pen angle along the stroke. Speed adds energy. The final stroke curves across to connect corner to corner. Letter Q next. It's like the G but with a simple straight descender. Letter T is similar but begins a little above the top line. It's not a full ascender, it's shorter than the D here. I flatten the pen angle to thin the crossbar. This stroke would be much thicker at the normal 40 degree pen angle. I'll sharpen the top with a fine line and also one for the D. A different fine line to begin this ascender, it's a letter L. You can mix and match these techniques. I've added F now, showing how you might connect its crossbar onto the following serif. F is not in the group with lower arches like the letter U. I added it here, as its crossbar is similar to that of T. Again, I flatten the pen angle to thin the stroke. This F has an ascender and a descender. When writing large, the hand needs to slide down the paper to make this long stroke. J is another letter that doesn't fit in any particular group, but I'll write it here. It's just like an I with a descender that curves to the left to thin it to a point. Here's a challenge, the word miniature. I've discussed these letters individually. The word begins the same as minimum. After practicing that regularly, it should become achievable to ensure all the spaces are equal. The second half of miniature has more complex spacing to manage, with the open counter spaces after T and R. I'll include this word on the printable PDF for download so you can copy it. I'll demonstrate O next. It's like A without its ending serif. I 
I curved outwards, just a hint on the final stroke, as I did on that of the N here. C, E and S form another letter group with O. C is like the O without its final stroke. Its spacing must be judged by I. You can see the distance is not the same between O and C. It's narrower at this point, yet it's wider down here, so we have to balance that by I. Because C has an open counter space, the next letter touches onto it to return to the regular spacing. E has half an open counter space at the base. Its spacing has to be judged by I. That takes some experience. The scribe of this page from the Great Parchment Book of Waterford made all the common beginner mistakes. The big word, tempore, shows several faults. The space after E is hugely wider than those inside the M. Space after the M is a little wide too. The space after R is also far too big. I've scaled this picket fence to the width of the middle letter P. Only the downstrokes of the O and R line up correctly. The smaller text also betrays a lack of training. This page, written ten years later in 1648, is better in every respect. The same word, tempore, is regular here and well spaced. The smaller script is well written, even though it's an unusually wide proportion for a Gothic script. The letter S will also follow the proportion of the O. It's a fun letter in this style. The right corner of the first stroke just touches the left corner of the second stroke. The final stroke can descend a little beneath the bass line. Here's another way of writing S. All the strokes can join onto a thin diagonal. You do not have to do that fast, but for me calligraphy is always balancing control with energy. The V group is the final letter group, which will complete the alphabet. I'll write a V next to this letter U. We can use similar curves to its first stroke. V and W have similar internal spaces. X is often a peculiar form in Gothic scripts. I've curved the top and base and made a vertical part in between. This part is similar to an R or an N arch. Here I've turned the nib to practically 90 degrees and curve up like so. Finally, I'll add a decorative stroke in the middle. That's similar to the top stroke, but I flatten the pen angle slightly to make it less thick. We can return to the V form for the letter Y. It is also similar to the G I wrote earlier. Now a gestural curve here. It's okay to make that a simple straight thin line. The final stroke curves so that its right corner just reaches the end point of the other stroke. It's nicely compact if the top of the curve touches the point at the base of the arch. Next, a Z will be an exception to the normal 40 degree pen angle. Here it is steeper, so the line thickness is about the same as vertical stems. 
next a thin diagonal, also at the steepened angle. That stroke can go from top to bottom if you prefer. I like to make the final downstroke tilt down a bit. I rotated the pen angle along that stroke, but you can more easily use the same steepened pen angle for the whole letter. That angle is about 60 degrees, but no need to focus on degrees. Watch to ensure the top and lower bars match the thickness of a vertical stem. The diagonal should be a thin line. Z can have a small decorative stroke here. K is the final letter in this group. Return to the normal 40 degree pen angle. Next, there's an arch as on N. Then slide down a thin line to join the stem just higher than halfway between the guidelines and repeat another arch stroke. Connect on just inside the tip of the point and curve at the end to make a simple serif. I've demonstrated a full alphabet in a Gothic style. Next, a few pointers about Gothic capital letters. As seen on this superior page from the Great Parchment Book of Waterford, Gothic capitals are more ornate and complicated than the lowercase. This older page of a Gothic script did not use any capitals for many of the headings. You could simply use all lowercase too. There is a capital form of a letter I for it here that's not too complex. I'll show you how to write a similar form. Using the normal 40 degree pen angle, begin with a slightly curving horizontal stroke. That's just lower than the tip of an ascender. Curve the stem a little too. The bottom curve is similar to those I showed on Y and G. Its right corner just touches the pointed base of the stem. A curved tooth is a common decoration on Gothic capitals. A fine line running close and parallel to a primary stroke is another common feature. I curved this by rotating the pen angle as I wrote, but it's easy to do as a straight line. I included these capitals on the PDF provided for download along with the lowercase alphabet. You can print that to help you copy the capitals. To summarize the way to begin practicing this Gothic script, begin with the letter N, then double it to make an M and continue it as an abstract series of equally spaced downstrokes. Then progress to short words with basic letters like him and nib. Imagine the strokes forming a picket fence with all the spaces both inside and between the letters the same. Words like rim and run are a challenge to match the space after R to all the others. The word minimum is a challenge to ensure your spaces inside M, N and U are all equal and also the spaces between the letters. Miniature is a further challenge for later. Then progress to other words. Watch me write Waterford in this style with more fluency than in the basic demonstrations. I marked the paper there with some ink that got on my hand. 
I'll show you how to remove that afterwards. I'll show you how to deal with a little uh, mark like this. Now the best way would be not to let it happen. If I was doing careful work, I'd have what I call a guard sheet. It's just a separate piece of paper and my hands rest on that. And when I load my pen with the uh, brush held in my left hand, um, any little drop that might happen, uh, it's always a risk, will drop on the guard sheet. And then that wouldn't have happened. However, Inevitably, sometimes, we do make mistakes like that. So what I've got here is a curved scalpel uh, blade. So it's important to have a curve, not to dig into the paper, but just to be able to scratch back and forth. Now, this is a good quality printmaking paper. It's called BFK Reeves. And uh, good quality papers, you can actually do this much more successfully than, say, on your copier paper or a cheap, thin paper. So, the next thing I can take an eraser and just rub off the loose paper fibers. And see, the mark, the ink is now gone. It's actually gouache paint I'm using, so I've just mixed that with uh, some water. And now it's still showing just as a little uh, raised fibres, so I'm putting the blade flat down on the paper and basically shaving off those loose fibres. Okay, and the final thing is I can use this uh, tool to, to burnish the surface. This is an agate uh, burnisher and it's known as a dog tooth because of the shape. So I'll just wipe off the uh, little bits by hand and just give it a soft burnish. A teaspoon would do the same thing. And that can be a lifesaver on a big job which is otherwise spoilt by a small mark. I decided to work a little more on this. Um, I used um, some mica crystals mixed with gum arabic to make a kind of copper paint and just added lines like that and uh, finished off with the full title of the museum's Waterford Treasures. And uh, I've also got a little quote here which is on uh, gilded paper. Come with me to Waterford to sing and make merry. Uh, 1413 quote from the mayor of the time. And that's going to slip underneath like so. Now if I'd been thinking at the time I was going to make something out of this, I would have written it on a clean sheet of paper, not with this other demonstration there. But what I decided to do is just to overlap that with a, a clean piece of paper, nice natural deckle edge of this uh, high quality mold made paper. And uh, that'll be a nice piece that I can send to the museum. I hope you'll want to order a pen and basic materials to begin to practice calligraphy. It can be an inspiring hobby or even a lifetime study. If you can visit the Waterford Treasures Museums, you can see their manuscript in the flesh, or at least in its parchment skin.
If not, you can browse every page on the Irish Script on Screen website, which you'll find if you Google that term. Enjoy practicing calligraphy. In addition to this tutorial, Waterford Treasures Museums asked me to make some creative short films featuring my contemporary calligraphy while reflecting on Ireland's scribal history. They are freely available thanks to sponsorship from Creative Ireland via Creative Waterford. If you'd like to get deeper into calligraphy, check out my online masterclasses at my Calligraphy TV website. <laughs>